on earth is going on? This is a question that I'm sure many in the world are today asking themselves, asking others, looking for guidance and understanding to, to grapple with what is it? Why is it that everything seems to be coming apart at the scenes, as it were, in the world? What on earth is going on? And our opening text was from Romans chapter 9. And I'm going to read once again from verses 27 and 8 as we begin this message. Uh, Isaiah also cries in verse 27 concerning Israel, God's people, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. Now that's somewhat of a sad prophesying that even if God's people, which today we as Seventh-day Adventists understand that we are modern-day Israel, we have replaced unfaithful Israel who crucified their Redeemer uh, and then began to persecute the followers of Christ as well. We have uh, picked up the mantle. The, the torch has been passed to seven-day Adventism to finish the work that Christ began on earth over 2,000 years ago. But the Bible is telling us here that even if we were to evangelize to the degree that uh, seven-day Adventism were to be able to boast that our numbers are as the sand of the sea, yet only a small portion, the remnant, shall be saved. Jesus goes on to say through Paul, his spirit inspired Paul to say, for he will finish the work. Notice, not any human agencies, but he, Jehovah, the God of all the earth, will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, praise God, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. I have a whole sermon on, on how God has throughout the 6,000 years set out to accomplish this work through his people Israel. And then, as we mentioned, Israel failing, he calls uh, the small remnant of faithful Judaism and it, it, it becomes the Christian church, but then the Christian church falls away, and you have the dark ages, and then the Protestant movement comes up, and it begins to recover the lost ground during the dark ages, but then the Protestant movement goes into uh, a, a phase of inefficiency, and then God raises up Seventh-day Adventism. And as we know, seven-day Adventism, it was not God's perfect will that we should have lasted in this world so long. If, it were, if God had have had his perfect will, Jesus would have come before now. But this is evident as to the seventh angel, or rather the seventh message to the seven churches, being that of Laodicea. So the Seventh-day Adventism has also followed suit in going into a lukewarm phase of unfaithfulness to God, seeking both to have some of God's will with some of our own will, some of the pleasures of this world as well as the pleasures of serving God. And Jesus tells us very plainly, if we do not repent as a people from this Laodicean lukewarm state, we will be spewed out of his mouth. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 to 21 and 22 there. So God tells us he's going to cut this thing short. He's going to cut it short in righteousness and make a short work in the, wor in the world. Now, how is 
this to take place? Is, are we going to begin having shorter days, 23-hour days, 18-hour days? How is God going to cut short his work? Well, before we go to answer that question, I want to share a statement with you, a couple of pages from volume nine of the Testimonies to the Church, page 97, and then page 93. The prophetess of the Lord declares more and more as the days go by, it is becoming apparent that God's judgments are in the world. In fire and flood and earthquake, he is warning the inhabitants of this earth of his near approach. The time is nearing when the great crisis in the history of the world will have come, when every movement in the government of God will be watched with intense interest and inexpressible apprehension. In quick succession, the judgments of God will follow one another, fire and flood and earthquake with war and bloodshed. Oh, that the people might know the time of their visitation. That's page 97. Going on to page 93. The angel that stood at my side, Ellen White says, then instructed me that but few have any conception of the wickedness existing in our world today. What an incredible statement. But few have any idea, any conception of how wicked this world is today, and especially the wickedness in the large cities. He declared that the Lord has appointed a time when he will visit transgressors in wrath for persistent disregard of his law. All right, so what is happening in the world today in light of these statements? Let us know that God more and more is allowing his judgments to take place, letting us know, warning the world, the end of all things is at hand. Life as we know it will soon come to an end. We can be assured that what we see happening before uh, today, things that are happening that have never happened before in the history of the world are letting us know without a doubt, hallelujah, that Jesus is coming soon. Praise the Lord. And as our dear pastor prayed in his prayer, those of us who are, are grieving the loss of loved ones, my, my wife and I were just at a funeral of a long uh, acquaintance of a dear sister whom we were expecting God to heal, but in his sovereignty, he allowed her to go to sleep. So all of us, I'm sure, know someone or are dealing with the loss of loved ones. And God tells us in, in that very light, I'd like to share with you something from God's word in relation to the death of loved ones. This is in Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah 57 verses 1 and 2. Notice what the word of God says. The righteous perishes, and no man lays it to heart, and merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. He shall enter into peace, they shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. We are told by inspiration, not only there in the Bible, the greater light, but also in the lesser light of the spirit of prophecy, that God will lay many to rest in uh, his mercy, that they will not be able to see the wicked, the evil that is coming upon our world. He knows what we can bear. 
and those who he sees fit, he lays to rest ahead of this crisis. And this very thing is another of the numerous signs that we can look at and realize that this is the final generation. The very fact that he is allowing many to be laid to rest is in itself a sign of the, of the soon return of Jesus Christ. So going on, let's look at how and why God permits so much destruction uh, in the world as is taking place today. Let's go to Romans chapter one. Romans chapter one, and notice what Paul instructs us about in verses 28. This is where we are today, and this is where the world has been before. Paul is talking about the past, but it applies to today. In Isaiah, uh, Romans 1.28, Paul says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient or fit. So this is what is happening to an increasing and alarming level in the world today that's bringing about all that we see. God is being pushed out of the knowledge of so many in the world today. They don't want God in their knowledge, and so God is forced finally to abandon them, to give them over to those things that they have cherished in opposition to his will. A reprobate mind. It's a very fearful thing. It means a mind that is empty of judgment, not able to tell anymore the difference between right and wrong. Those who have come to the place where they call evil good and good evil. Going on, he says, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, notice this next one, inventors of evil things. This is what is going on in our world today more than most people are aware of. Inventing evil things, things that are designed to destroy life. Going on, it says, <clears throat> disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, which means irreconcilable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in those that do them. This is what the world has become today. The world does not like to retain God in their knowledge. And this is not only the world, this is also the churches, unfortunately, are pushing the true knowledge of God out of their knowledge. Having a form, as Paul says, of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Now, We've been the, we, the world has been here before, as we mentioned. In Genesis 6 and verse 3, God tells us that he looked upon the sons of men and gave them a probationary period of 120 years. He says, my spirit will not always strive with man because his days, his, his thoughts are evil. So this is the same thing that Paul is speaking about here. God, through his spirit, strives with man to turn him from his evil, 
from his wickedness, to bring him to his senses, that the course of sin is that of self-destruction. But it man comes to the place where <clears throat> God is pushed out and their probation is closed. Their hearts are hardened beyond all repair. And as Genesis 15 verse 16 tells us, not only is this the case on the individual level, but it also applies to the national level where uh, God tells Abraham about the Amorites that the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So the Bible lets us know and on volume five of the testimonies to the church, she deals with this in the chapter, the uh, seal of God, that God keeps a record with the nations. And he keeps the record with figures dealing with the wickedness that mankind is doing in the nations of the world. And it's in relationship to how much light also has been given to these nations. And when she says the figures reach a certain level, the ministry of his mercy is over and the ministry of his wrath begins. So this is where we are increasingly coming to in all the world. And notice that these are people that know the judgment of God. They know that they must be punished for all of this in the end, but it doesn't matter to them. They have given themselves over to the service of wickedness. So notice this next statement in this regard from Review and Herald, February the 11th, 1902. In the condition of the world today, we see the terrible result of living for self. God's spirit is being withdrawn from the earth, which in its moral pollution is as it was before the flood and as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. So great is the corruption of the cities that the moral atmosphere is as poisonous as the atmosphere of a pest house. From generation to generation, sin has demoralized society, bringing a continual increase of depravity and degradation. Notice the next sentence. Soon, from the highest authority in the universe will come the word Shorten the days, lest no flesh be saved. What a solemn time. And I believe, beloved, that we have now reached that time. I believe that that pronouncement has been made now. The God has decreed it is time to shorten the days. Now, once again, it's not that we're going to have shorter days, 18-hour days or 10-hour days, but God is increasingly allowing the enemy to work his will upon the sons of men because so many more now, as Jesus said would happen, the hearts of many will wax cold. The love of many would wax cold because so many are passing the point of no return, listening to hear no more the voice of God in their souls. This is how Ellen White said, we would come to the time when the final movements would be rapid ones. And that time is here. We have entered the phase, I do believe with all my heart, that the days are being shortened. Satan is being permitted to do what he was not permitted to do in the past. Maybe just five years ago, 10 years ago, Satan is now being allowed to do more and more upon this earth 
as more and more in this world surrender themselves to his lordship, that is, of his satanic majesty. So, now notice in Matthew 24, where we are and what is to happen next in the scheme of things. In Matthew 24, where Jesus is dealing with the end of the world, the signs of knowing when his coming is near. He tells us in verse seven, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences. The word there for pestilences means uncontrollable diseases. And here we are. Have we ever seen a time in the world's history in which a pestilence has had an effect on all the world as it has had in our time, where all the nations of the world are in essence affected by this COVID-19. Amazing. And earthquakes in diverse places. And notice Jesus says all of this is but the beginning of sorrows. Now, that word for sorrows is very interesting. It actually is the word for birth pangs. The beginning of birth pangs are where we are today. In other words, in this symbology, the baby is soon to be born. The earthquakes, the famines, the pestilences are all birth pangs, letting us know that it will not be long before the baby, which is symbolizing the coming of Jesus, is to take place. Praise God. We are required, Ellen White tells us in Great Controversy, we're required to know when his coming is near. We are not to know at this time the day or the hour of his coming, but we are required to know when it is near. And these are the signs proving beyond shadow of a doubt that the baby is about to be born. Jesus is about to make his appearance. But notice what is to happen next in verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations. Why? For Christ's sake. Oh, beloved, this is where things are heading very quickly. We are to be brought into the spotlight of earth history, of, of the uh, inhabitants of the world as never before. Now, history is being repeated and is to be repeated. Notice this statement from Great Controversy, page 40. These persecutions, she's speaking of, that took place in the early Christian history, beginning under Nero about the time of the martyrdom of Paul, which took place around 64 or so uh, AD, Continued, she says, with greater or less fury for centuries, Christians were falsely accused of the most dreadful crimes and declared to be the cause, notice, of great calamities, famine, pestilence, and earthquake. Isn't that amazing? The Christians, in Paul, starting from Paul's time, and going forward into the early centuries of Christian history were, uh, were falsely accused to be the cause of these famines, the cause of these pestilences, the cause of these earthquakes. As they became the objects of popular hatred and suspicion, informers stood ready for the sake of gain to betray the innocent. They were condemned as rebels against the empire, as foes of religion, and pests 
to society. Wow. So this is the lot. This is what happened to God's people hundreds and hundreds of years ago. But it is soon to be repeated. Notice from the same book, Great Controversy, page 589 now and 590. <clears throat> it is God that shields his creatures and hedges them in from the power of the destroyer. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. But the Christian world have shown contempt for the law of Jehovah, and the Lord will do just what he has declared that he would do. He will withdraw his blessings from the earth and remove his protecting care from those who are rebelling against his law and teaching and forcing others to do the same. Satan has control of all whom God does not especially guard. He, Satan, will favor and prosper some in order to further his own designs. And he will bring trouble upon others and lead men to believe that it is God who is afflicting them. While appearing to the children of men as a great physician who can heal all their maladies, he, Satan, will bring disease and disaster until popular cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. Oh, beloved, you think we're seeing something now. Notice what this statement is telling us. Soon we're going to see whole populous cities, cities where millions are still uh, living at this time are going to be reduced to ruin and desolation. The word desolation means empty. Oh, beloved, are we having any idea of the soon coming events and what we must be to stand in this solemn time that we have now entered the end of time going on? Even now, he is at work in accidents and calamities by sea and by land, in great conflagrations, fires, in tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves, and earthquakes, in every place and in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. He sweeps away the ripening harvest, and famine and distress follow. He noticed this next statement, he, Satan, imparts to the air a deadly taint, and thousands perish by the pestilence. That is exactly what we're seeing today. Beloved, this COVID-19, I truly believe, did not come from nature. This comes directly from the devil, from his agents who are imparting to the air a deadly taint, and thousands are perishing by this man-made pestilence. Just want you to know, beloved, <clears throat> that Satan is behind directly what is happening. And it, is, it, is, it has never been a time where it, is, it has been as important as now to follow the counsels God has given us of the health message. We must appreciate what God has given us and follow them so that we are safe from these numerous pestilences. This is just the beginning, beloved. She says these visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. But notice the next part, and then the great deceiver will persuade men that those who serve God, that's you and I, are causing these evils. The class that have provoked the displeasure of heaven and that are really the ones bringing on this disaster will charge all their troubles upon you and I whose obedience to God's commandments is a perpetual reproof to transgressors. 
Oh, beloved, history is about to be repeated. As it happened in the past, so it is to happen in our day. Don't <laughs> doubt it at all. Now, let's go to the next part of this message, which is found in Daniel chapter 4. God rules. We're going to see through the next few texts that God rules all to perform his will. God rules and overrules all to work out his perfect will. In Daniel chapter 4 and verse 17, notice this startling statement. This matter is by the decree of the watchers, Daniel is telling Nebuchadnezzar, and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will and sets up over the, it the basest of men. Wow, this is an amazing text. You mean God himself purposely sets up based men over governments? Yes, beloved. This is what the Bible says. This is what the, the, the prophet of God under the inspiration of God is revealing to Nebuchadnezzar that God in his sovereignty puts in place the basis, the most evil, the most wicked, the most hard-headed over men to fulfill his will. Well, how can this be? Let's go next to Romans chapter 9, and we will see what God's will is in setting up the basis of men over the kingdoms of men. In Romans chapter 9, notice what it says in verse 17, speaking of Pharaoh as another example. He says, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, even for this same purpose, have I raised you up, <laughs> that I might show my power in you and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord God of heaven. God has a purpose even for the wicked. God works his will out even by using those who are evil, those who are hard-headed, those who have passed the point of no return. He uses both the wicked and the righteous to perform his will. Notice he points out two things. I am the one, God says, responsible for your being in control of the most powerful nation in the world at that time in Egypt for two reasons. I'm going to show my power in you. And number two, in doing so, because I'm going to use your hard-headedness, because I'm going to use your unwillingness to, to turn to me, all the world is going to hear about my name, praise God, because of your hard-headedness. Oh, God, he's so wonderful. He's in total control, even in our world today, when we wonder how is it that so many evil people can get in control of government? Keep this in mind, beloved. It could not have happened unless it was God's will. And God is working out his will. Here's another example. Let's go over to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 15, where the Bible tells us the Lord said unto Elijah, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you come, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. All right, so God is telling his prophet to go and anoint Hazael to be the king over Syria. Now go to 2 Kings from there, chapter 8. 
2 Kings chapter 8. And notice what verses 12 through 15 inform us of. It says, and Hazel said, why, this is Elisha now, why weepest my Lord, Elisha? And Elisha answered, because I know the evil that you will do to the children of Israel. Their strongholds will you set on fire. And their young men will you slay with the sword. And you will dash their children and rip up their women with child. And Hazel said, but what is thy servant, a dog, that he should do this great thing? And Elisha answered, the Lord has showed me that you shall be king over Syria. So he departed from Elisha and came to his master who said to him, what said Elisha to you? And he answered, he told me that you should surely recover. And it came to pass on the morrow that he took a thick cloth and dipped it in water, spread it on his face so that he died and Hazel reigned in his stead. And he did exactly what the prophet told him he would do. Now, remember here that God was the one who had him anointed by his prophet to be a scourge to his own people. Oh, beloved, this is so solemn. We see the same thing happening in the history of Balaam. When his people were faithful, Balaam could not curse God's people. But when Satan uh, was able to ensnare the people of God into sin, now they were plagued by the plagues of God. You find that in Numbers 23, to, uh, chapter 23 on to chapter 25, verse 9. So this is the principle that is in play today, not only in the world, but even with the people of God. God shows his power in the disobedient and the rebellious so that his name is known in all the world. Let's go to Revelation 17, one more text that shows that God even uses the wicked to accomplish his purposes. This is Revelation 17, verse 17. Revelation 17, verse 17 says, for God, speaking of the 10 horns that give their kingdom to the beast, it says God has put in their hearts to fulfill his will <laughs> and to give uh, 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 rather to agree and give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Wow. So this speaks about the time in which you and I are living right now. The world is being brought into these crises such as COVID-19 so that God's will be performed. The world is being tied together in, in what is being called this new world order, so that we have one uh, governing authority, supposedly, and we know that it will be very short-lived and very uh, ineffective. And nevertheless, there will be a one world uh, attempt to rule the world, a one world currency, they are working towards a one world joining together of all the religions of the world. There will be one universal harmony. And that's where we are today. And this prophecy is telling us that we need not worry. As God's people, we must understand that it is God's will for this to come about so that his will is performed. Praise God. And we know that his will is that his name is published throughout the world. Let's look at some texts that bear on this subject of God's will that he's performing through this terrible crisis that we are now entering. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah 
chapter 66, the very uh, book, incredible book that we are studying in our Sabbath school lessons this quarter. Isaiah 66, notice what he has to tell us here from verse 18. For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. Praise God. This is our part. This is where we come in. This is why we have been raised up to show God's glory to all nations, all tongues, all people, in spite of this terrible crisis that we're now going into. God is, gonna, God is using this new world order effort to do this very thing, to gather the nations so that they all can see the glory of Jesus Christ. Praise God. This is the first angel's message. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Here we are, beloved. This is incredible time for us to be alive. We are going to see incredible things that our eyes and our, our thoughts and our imagination could never have thought of before. He goes on to say, I will set a sign among them. I will send those that escape of them to the nations, to Tarshish, Pull and Lud that draw the bow to Tubal and Javan to the isles afar off that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. Beloved, this is our work. This is where we come in. There are still places in this world that have never heard of the glory of God have never heard even the name of Jesus Christ. And this work must be accomplished before we can go home. And thank God, as, as this message begins, he's going to take control of this work and cut it short in righteousness. Going on in verse 20, and they will bring all your brethren for an offering to the Lord out of all nations upon horses and in chariots and in litters and upon mules and upon swift beasts to my holy mountain, Jerusalem. That's God's church in these last days. saith the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord, and I will also take of them for priests and for Levites, saith the Lord, praise God. Oh, God is looking down at this very time upon his precious people all throughout this world who he knows are honest in their hearts and in their minds. They just don't have the light. They just don't know what is the way. And he's longing for, to be able to use you and I to go to his people and gather them into his holy mountain, Jerusalem, praise God. Malachi chapter 1 and verse 11. Malachi chapter 1 and verse 11. God says, for from the rising of the sun, even to the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles or the nations. And in every place, incense shall be offered unto my name and a pure offering for my name shall be great among the heathen, the nations, once again, saith the Lord of hosts. This is a prophecy, and you and I, by God's grace, can play our individual and corporate role in fulfilling this very prophecy, that God's name is published throughout the world. I can't tell you exactly how God is going to do it, but he told us in testimonies to ministers, he's going to work in this last work in a way that is entirely out of the common order of things and contrary to any human planning. Why? Because God and God alone is to receive the glory. Hallelujah. He says, my glory, I will not give to another. Praise God. So this is God's will that he is using the wicked 
nations and the wicked rulers of this world to accomplish in spite of themselves, praise God. The most high rules in the kingdom of men. So as we bring uh, this message to a close, we want once again to look at this incredible thing of God cutting short this work in righteousness. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 24, Matthew 24 and verse 22. I want you to notice, uh, the, I, I've, I've been looking at this particular text all week long and chewing on this, trying to understand, Lord, the magnitude of this very verse. Matthew 24, verse 22, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Wow, this is full of meaning. We have come to the time, I believe this verse is telling us, that the world is becoming so wicked that if God were not to shorten the days and not to speed up allowing the devil to do and work his will as he is doing now, none of us, no flesh, would be saved. Notice what the uh, uh, Peter has to say in this regard in 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 18. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? The word therefore scarcely means hardly, with difficulty. Even those of us who profess to love and serve God, it's with great difficulty that God has on his hands to save you and I. Oh, beloved, if he didn't shorten the days, there should no flesh be saved. Well, some of you may, may be saying, <laughs> how could that be? Notice what the pen of inspiration says uh, in Ellen White's writing in this regard, Review and Herald, 529-1894. The end of all things is at hand. And if the days were not shortened, there would no flesh be saved. Why, she goes on to tell you, for iniquity abounds and the love of many waxes cold. The world is becoming like Sodom and Gomorrah, like the world before the flood and terrible scenes are before us, end quote. Now, beloved, I want you to get the magnitude of what this means. In Noah's day, you know, Jesus has plainly told us that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days when the Son of Man comes. And here we are. But in the days of Noah, I want you to think deeply about the fact that out of the world, there were only eight people that got in that ark and were saved. Now, to help you with the perspective of this, remember that in the time of Noah, the general lifespan was 900 years old. Think about this. If you were to be born at the time that God set that 120 year probation, if you were born at the beginning of that period, by the time 120 years had expired, you would be the equivalent to our lifespan, almost 10 years old. Almost 10 years old. In other words, you had that much more of a lifetime to look forward to. 
at 120 years old. And so I did some little bit of research amongst those who were students of the Bible online to get some idea of how many people might have been alive when this flood came upon the world. And I found estimates of 15 billion, which is more than twice the amount of people that are on the world today of 7 billion, as high as over 10 trillion people alive during the flood. <laughs> now, does that bring into your mind now the focus out of much more of a population of the world than we have today. There were only eight souls saved in the flood. Now we can understand why God is telling us that if he didn't shorten the days today, there would no flesh be saved. Lord, have mercy on us. Let's go to Acts of the Apostles. This is where we will close this message today. In Acts of the Apostles, page 560. In light of all of these things, what manner of persons ought we to be? Notice what the pen of inspiration says. Sanctification is not the work of a moment, an hour, a day, but of a lifetime. It is not gained by a happy flight of feeling, but is the result of constantly dying to sin, God help us, and constantly living for Christ. Wrongs cannot be righted, nor reformations wrought in the character by feeble, intermittent efforts. It is only by long, persevering effort, sore discipline, and stern conflict that we shall overcome. We know not one day how strong will be our conflict the next. So long as Satan reigns, we shall have self to subdue, besetting sins to overcome. So long as life shall last, there will be no stopping place, no point which we can reach and say, I have fully attained. No, sanctification is the result of lifelong obedience. And lifelong obedience, beloved, tonight, today, is lifelong trust of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith and obedience go together. They cannot be separated. We cannot have the commandments of God without also having the faith of Jesus. They both are given to us to save us entirely from our sins. And as long as we continue to surrender absolutely, unreservedly, continually to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, we are assured of being saved eternally. Thank God. He is our Savior. And in the world today, we have the hope, not only for ourselves, but to bring to all the world that they too have a redeemer, a high priest in heaven today waiting to invite them into the family of all of heaven, all the universe. I pray today that we will all join with Jesus Christ, with the angels, to help God finish his work and cut short this account in righteousness. He will finish the work, beloved, not ourselves. It is a work far beyond our capacity. We are only the assistants, and he, the Holy Ghost, the person of Jesus Christ, 
is the master worker who changes hearts, transforms us into his image. Will you today with me a new make your covenant with the Lord to Amen. surrender your soul, your mind, your body to his absolute lordship? If so, will you bow with me in, in token of that decision? Father in heaven, we do all that is in our power to do. Surrender to you. Lord, come and take us. Lord, we cannot even of ourselves give you our hearts, give you its affections. We are weak and impotent in the face of this terrible principle of sin that has entered our existence. But Lord, we're so thankful that though we were without strength, in due time, Christ died for us the ungodly, to give us the strength we have not, so that we can raise up from the dead spiritually and become life in Christ Jesus, become the righteousness of God in him. Lord, please use us. As you continue to transform us, please lighten the earth with your glory through us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.